Emily Dickinson pushes romantic tradition to bizarre and difficult new places. She revolutionizes the idea of what romanticism can be and in the way bridges it straight into uh, realism. She takes the, uh, the romantic enthusiasm and infatuation with the immaterial, with the intangible, with concerns about uh, mood and essentially blows that up by investing it with the kind of concrete images, uh, the kind of concrete images that are based on realism, that uh, but that take on whole new areas of uh, of meaning. In so doing, she also uh, pushes through realism into a kind of proto modernism. Where the uh, where the images speak for themselves, divorced from any notion of language and uh, the traditions of rhetoric, it's uh, she is one of the more difficult poets uh, in the history of literature, and she's really one of the more uh, she can be one of the more fun because she's so idiosyncratic. You cannot. You cannot fit her neatly into any little pigeonhole. She is utterly unique. Um, the uh, she has she wrote an awful lot. Famously, she never published during her lifetime. Uh, and when a friend found them in uh, among her effects after her death, they did publish them. And then famously from that. You get a lot of revision of, well, the editors tended to take a heavy hand to her work and correct a lot of the uh, punctuation, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the grammar, and fill in, you know, those rough spots that she left. But it's the rough spots and it's the irregularity that uh, really make it what it is. The, uh, over time, Editors have and scholars have gone back and said, "Okay, let's let's push this a little closer to the original vision. Let's check her manuscripts. Let's check what she has." And uh, has the they've swung that pendulum back a little closer to what she likely intended, uh, and in so doing, invests the whole corpus with uh, an appropriate amount of strangeness that, again, makes it fun. Um, I, but she did write an awful lot. Short lyrics, um, often quite puzzling, uh, on a variety of topics, but with certain very uh, persistent themes. Um, I, no titles, she numbers them. Or at least uh, they are numbered. They are untitled. But a lot of people uh, will know them by their first lines. Uh, I taste a liquor, number 214. I taste a liquor never brewed from tankards scooped in pearl. Not all the Frankfurt belly berries yield such an alcohol. Inebriate of air am I and debauchee of dew, reeling through endless summer days from inns of molten blue. When landlords turn the drunken bee out of the foxglove's door, when butterflies renounce their drams, I shall but drink the more. Till seraphs swing their snowy hats to see the little, uh, and saints to windows run, to see the little tippler from Manzanilla come. Here, I think you can see here now, again, I'm not sure about the order of this. I assume this is in a rough chronological order. I don't know. Uh, but you can see the, uh, the romanticism at play here, but what she does with it is really quite clever. I taste a liquor never brewed. Uh, she is, she is getting drunk off of a kind of, uh, spirituality, an ethereality, a, uh, something beyond the physical, which is all hardcore romanticism. Um, from tankard scooped in pearl, not all the Frankfurt berries yield such an alcohol. So again, it's, it's, it's this sweeping romantic vision, but it is built on uh, fairly concrete 
uh, images, realist images. Pearl and berries give it a kind of grounded quality. But from there, after that first stanza, it starts to get progressively more detached from the realism, from the groundedness. Um, uh, inebriate of air am I and debauchee of dew, reeling through endless summer days and ends of molten blue. And I'm not sure what a lot of that means, honestly. It seems to be leaving behind um, a, 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 a romantic, uh, it, it seems to be leaving me behind, honestly. Uh, when landlords, in quotation marks, turn the drunken bee out of Foxglove's door, when butterflies renounce their drams, also in, in quotation marks, I shall but drink the more, uh, till seraphs, in the, that last stanza gets, gets full on weird, till seraphs swing their snowy hats and saints to windows run to see the little tippler from Manzanilla come. I don't know what any of that means. It seems to have gotten away from a uh, recognizable sense. And she is riding a kind of romantic enthusiasm along the way. So I read this poem, this is just me, I read this poem as a kind of critique of romanticism, that it can get out of hand, that when you just ride on the, uh, the enthusiasm of your poem, you can lose a lot of sense and ultimately it becomes um, indecipherable. The, uh, just my reading. 216. Safe in their alabaster chambers, untouched by morning and untouched by noon, sleep the meek members of the resurrection, rafter of satin and roof of stone. Light laughs the breeze in her castle above them, babbles the bee in a stolid ear, pipe the sweet birds in ignorant cadence. Ah, what sagacity perished here. Um, this is a, a type two stanzas where the first one describes uh, uh, the experience of being in church and then, and the second one describes uh, the the, uh, the in contrast nature, um, both within this experience of religiosity, uh, but just look how it is. Uh, with neither one uses the term, neither stanza uses the term church or nature. It is built of simple concrete images, constructed entirely. Uh, with no declared label uh, of either locale. Um, alabaster chambers, uh, sleep the meek members of the resurrection, rafter of satin, roof of stone. This is all giving an image of the exterior qualities, the visible qualities of the church. And then the next one is just, um, you have the breeze, you have the babbles of the of uh, the bee. These are all sense, uh, sensual, sense, uh, sensory um, experiences uh, of nature that it are set in sharp contrast to the somewhat imposing alabaster chambers of the church. And the the obvious reading is that it's a it's a contrast of uh, the, the value of the church as opposed to the value of, um, uh, of, 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 in, of being in nature, which is again very romantic, um, strip, uh, strip spirituality of religion necessarily, and you can get something more authentic um, than the, uh, the pious, polite platitudes of, uh, of dogma which is a cultural incrustation on, uh, on spirituality. Um, but those little ways that she's playing with it, it, with concrete images, very realistic images, can show her complicating her, uh, her participation in the romantic tradition. Uh, one of her more famous ones, uh, 258. There's a certain slant of light, winter afternoons, that opposes, like the heft of cathedral tunes. Heavenly hurt it gives us, 
we can find no scar, but internal difference where the meanings are. None may teach it any. Tis the seal despair, an imperial affliction sent us of the air. When it comes, the landscape listens, shadows hold their breath. When it goes, tis like the distance on the look of death. A uh, couple things here. Uh, the dashes are her most famous uh, uh, punctuation point. Uh, that's what she's kind of known for. And then, of course, it's what the original editor first scratched out and started putting in, you know, periods, commas, semicolons, and, you know, it just it doesn't have the same effect. The dashes tend to break up the, uh, the cadence a little. The dashes... Uh, give it a intentional roughness there you cannot read any of her lines particularly flowingly like the I uh, think in terms of Shelley and Byron and even Wordsworth uh, this this endless flowing 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 language that the romantics just really love and uh, she is troubling that an awful lot she is throwing a wrench in that easy smooth gear nothing here in Dickinson is smooth it is all quite irregular and for a reason um, but look at the uh, look at the poem there's a certain slant of light that oppresses like the heft of cathedral tunes again um, this notion of the cathedral a church being somewhat uh, oppressive or uh, alien um, heavenly hurt it gives us so this sense of the specter of death I would say uh, a certain slant, slant of light that oppresses it's a specter of death that comes from winter afternoons from from climate essentially uh, climate and time I guess um, but it is a, a, an effect of nature rather than spirituality um, heavenly hurt it gives us and again look at the irregular capitalizations another odd quirk that uh, that she tends to uh, insist upon that can get a little sand in the gears of easy interpretation uh, there 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 are very irregular capitalizations just like dashes that just make you puzzle over well why is that word seemingly emphasized heavenly hurt it gives us we can find no scar but internal difference where the meanings are the sense of the internal uh, again very very romantic uh, a celebration of the irrational of uh, against the uh, the objective supposedly experience of the world it's more about your perception of it uh, but notice also the use of the word it there is a certain slant of light winter afternoons that oppo that oppresses like the heft of cathedral tunes okay so certain slant of light is the subject of uh of of this and everything after that references an it and it's a little uncertain and i guess it's referring to that certain slant of light but we haven't really nailed down exactly what that is it has a certain uh uh, quality of the uh, the unphysical internal um, it's just a looming threat a potentiality of, of, uh, of danger or death um, but it's 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 not that specific and that repetition of it 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 well you know she knows a lot of words she can come up with something stronger than a, a than a simple pronoun like it uh, maybe something that could give us a firmer idea of this, but no, she's trying to be enigmatic. And so you get something that you're not quite certain. And that uncertainty is a, uh, that uncertainty is her, it's her, uh, almost, uh, deliberate, uh, mode of escaping easy interpretation. She wants you to work for it. Uh, and there is ultimately, I would say, no answer at the end. Uh, it's not a, uh, it's, it's not an easy thing that you can just sort of read and close the book and say, oh, that feels good, and go right to sleep. This is something meant to trouble you. This is a, an early iteration of what Freud will eventually call the uncanny, uh, something that is 
uh, strange and irresolvable in rational terms. Um, 303, the soul selects her own society, then shuts the door to her divine majority, present no more. Unmoved, she notes the chariots pausing at her low gate. Unmoved, an emperor be kneeling upon her mat. I've known her from an ample nation. Choose one, then close the valves of her attention like stone. Just a couple quick notes on this. Note very choppy, very broken, no smooth lines at all. You can't really read this from one line to the other and have any sort of uh, uh, easy rhythm to fall into. It doesn't read like natural speech. It doesn't read like metered poetry. It's just a square peg in a round hole, let's say. Uh, but also just notice the character of it. Uh, the soul selects her own society. Uh, the, maybe it's just me, but I see the, uh, uh, the pronoun her as a little uh, assertive in her, um, in her feminine identity. Um, but it's also, um, it's also a sense of self-assurance. There is, throughout this, this whole little poem, is a declaration of spiritual self-sufficiency. She doesn't need uh, a, a lot of people supporting her. And you think about it, you know, again, biography, especially with a figure like Dickinson, about whom we know so little, but we suppose so much, uh, you don't want to, you don't want to go running away with biography, but there is a certain, um, curiosity about the fact that she wrote all of these poems, never published them during her lifetime didn't care to. Um, you know, she's just writing it for the art itself. Interesting aesthetic right there. Um, 328. A bird came down the walk he did not know I saw. He bit an angleworm in halves and ate the fellow raw. Then he drank a dew from a convenient grass and then hopped bedwise to the wall to let a beetle pass. He glanced with rapid eyes that hurried all around. They looked like frightened beads, I thought. He stirred his velvet head. Like one in danger, cautious, I offered him a crumb, and he unrolled his feathers and rowed him softer home. Then oars divided the ocean to, to silver for a seam, or butterflies off banks of noon lump, leap, plashless as they swim. Interesting progression of this, uh, of this poem. Uh, it starts off so domestic. A bird came down the walk. It's like, you know, a, uh, a wild animal, but is coming up the walk. Uh, you know, just stopping by for, uh, for a cold drink on an afternoon to sit on the porch and have a talk. Um, so homey, so domestic. Uh, but then you get that immediate image, um, of him biting a worm in half and ate the fellow raw. Raw, well, obviously he wasn't gonna run out and cook it, but that sense of, oh yeah, this is a wild animal. This is untamed nature. Uh, so right there, you get that neat um, combination punch of domesticity and wildness, one on top of the other. She won't let you rest in the pleasant little thing of, oh, a little birdie coming to visit. Um, and then notice how formally, what, what happens from there. And then he drank a dew from a convenient grass. Uh, grass automatically makes you think of, well, when you drink, you drink from a glass. So, and and uh, the capitalization perhaps is emphasizing that word. So then that's just a little bit off. And you think, oh, okay, well, that's right. Grass, you're not going to drink from it glass, that's silly, but from grass, that makes sense. You drink dew off the grass, especially in the morning, presumably. And then hop sidewise to the wall to let a beetle pass. And you get that nice little grass to pass rhyme, which mirrors the uh, steady rhyme of the first stanza. And then he glanced with rapid eyes that hurried around. They looked like frightened beads, I thought. He stirred his velvet head. 
uh, and then suddenly, you know, the, well, what happened to the rhyme? Uh, hurried all around and stirred his velvet head? That doesn't rhyme at all. So now we're really like, oh, well, that's, that's sort of off. That's not quite uh, what I was expecting. Um, but also the sense that, you know, oh, we're getting even wilder. The bird attacked a worm. Okay, but now when a bird is glancing around with rapid eyes, when anything in nature is glancing around with rapid eyes, generally because uh, it feels like it might be vulnerable, like there is a predator about. Um, and, and so much so that the, the bird is evidently feeling fear uh, of sorts. They look like frightened beads, not eyes, but beads. So automatically it's a little representational, uh, but also don't pass over the word like, making it a simile. So it's a representation. We don't honestly know what's going on in that head of that bird. There is a kind of uh, impenetrable actuality there that you just can't access. You can only suppose. Um, like one in danger. He stirred his velvet head like one in danger. Notice how that, uh, that quick little finishing uh, from one to the other. That's a, uh, an open line break, an enjambment it's called, where the, it, it, the line doesn't finish neatly like it did at the beginning uh, in the, the earlier uh, sentences. It doesn't, the sentence doesn't finish neatly at the end of the line. Um, like one in danger. Cautious, I offered him a crumb. The enjambment continues. I offered him a crumb. So here you seem to be... Uh, having painted the picture of this bird, uh, the hunter has now become the hunted, uh, you see further effort at domestication, let's say, uh, where the poet, the narrator, is offering out a crumb, like you're going to feed the birds or in the park or something, toss them breadcrumbs. And he unrolled his feathers and rode him softer home than oars divide the ocean. And now the enjambment is just, you know, uh, it's like, oh, okay, suddenly we're right into the whole next stanza. It leaves realist attenuation behind and just soars off on its romanticism. Because the poet, it would seem to me, the narrator, having tried to domesticate this, uh, this wild bird, wild animal, um, sort of takes that and, oh, okay, it flies off. The bird presumably is afraid, uh, maybe of the poet, maybe of a predator that might be around, um, but it's leaving for its own purposes, certainly. And the poem in that last stanza, in that final bit, uh, then oars divide the ocean, two silver forests seem, or butterflies off banks of noon leap clashless as they swim. I, the rhyme is coming back a little bit from seem to swim, but it's still irregular. Um, but either way, it's, uh, it, it doesn't make sense. I don't know what it's saying. Um, you get more anchored in images, um, but it's a romanticism of images so that the sensibility, while it builds on the uh, the oars, the ocean, the, uh, the butterflies, the banks of noon, uh, the swimming, whatever. It, it, it's got a notion of imagery that is concrete, but you're not sure what is doing any of those things. You're not sure. It, they just seem to be uh, poetic tropes thrown in there for no purpose whatsoever. That's discernible. It's romanticism gotten carried away. So you have a case of nature being somewhat uh, untamable by language because language soon makes it ridiculous. Another one of her famous lines, after great pain, a formal feeling comes. The nerves sit ceremonious like tombs. The stiff heart questions, was it he that bore and yesterday or centuries before? The feet, mechanical, go round of ground or air or aught, a wooden way, regardless grown, a quartz contentment like a stone. This is the hour of lead, remembered if outlived, as freezing persons recollect the snow, first chill, then stupor, then the letting go.
this is an example of one of her favorite topics or themes, and that is, uh, you know, well, death, and specifically the kind of um, culture of funerals and um, and mourning, and the uh, the habits of mourning, the the, uh, the traditions of mourning, and you can see how it, she breaks it down um into again images uh the feet mechanical go round um uh, just that sense of in a wake or at a funeral for those of you who've ever lost someone you care about you can be quite numb after great pain a formal feeling comes you this uh this heavy obligation to observe the moment descends on you and it gives you a kind of outward performance that you're not even you're not even really feeling that there is no real sincerity behind it honestly you are mechanically going through the motions of mourning um, the nerves sit ceremonious like tombs the the nerves are just they're shattered. The, perhaps the grief, you've passed the first wave, there's more coming, but right now you're in a trough and you're just going through mechanically, shaking hands, saying to people, thank you for coming, um, you know, exchanging pleasantries, but it's, uh, it's not particularly sincere which means it's not particularly um, actual. It's not real. It's just a superficial uh, habit. Um, the uh, but if you look at it, what she's doing with this is really a kind of uh, proto modernism, absolute modernism, honestly. Uh, in the way the images, rather than the logic, carry the uh, the emotion, uh, or carry the message, because it, there is no logic to what's going on. It's suffused. Uh, you can sit there and, as I just did, break down. Okay, this is what is happening, but realistically, the poem does not do that. It suggests it. I think very powerfully through the images, but it doesn't lay that out for you. Uh, it's almost like the language and logic itself is a kind of inheritance of the past. That it is that romanticism here is looking to shear away, um, and the realism, and well, modernism. Honestly, all of these schools are swimming around in her head at the same time frankly, and they're not schools to her, they're just, I would say, intuitions. All of this, she scrapes away. Tradition goes out the window, logic goes out the window. She's not trying to say, I, I lost somebody that I cared about a great deal today, and I felt this, and then I felt that. She is just summoning up these visceral images, these emotions, these moods, without the explanation. There's no footnote that carries the day here. Um, all of that is dispelled for the more elemental feelings that the images themselves convey through language, but really independent of language, because it's not the language that does it. It's the power of the simple images, quite frankly, of as freezing persons recollect the snow, that, that sense of the distance between what you're perceiving and what the truth might really be. It's, uh, it's, it's a disturbing, uh, it's a very disturbing lyric that um, hints at depths that no one in American letters, uh, and you know, possibly 
uh, certain complications and nuances that are very unique in any world literature scope either. Um, 534, uh, 435. Much madness is divinest sense to a discerning eye, much sense the starkest madness. Tis the majority in this, as all, prevail. Assent, and you are sane. Demur, and you're straightaway dangerous, and handled with a chain. Another declaration of self-sufficiency, another declaration of independence of sorts, uh, a critique of authority. Uh, she was not going to um, go quietly and just play along. She insisted on working by her own rules. And uh, I think this, uh, this little lyric suggests that, you know, why, why should she shave off her rough edges uh, just for the world that might want it? Maybe, maybe if she got rid of some of the dashes and made the... Uh, you know, smoothed over some of the rough spots and made everything a little bit more polite and accessible, maybe she would have had a grand readership. She would have been loved, but that wasn't in her. She didn't want to do that. And she was forced, I would say, this polite, retiring, very quiet as a church mouse type lady in, uh, in Amherst, Massachusetts, was forced into the role of being a rebel. And I kind of like that. Um, another famous one, 449, I died for beauty, but was scarce adjusted in the tomb when one who died for truth was laying in an adjoining room. He questioned softly why I failed. For beauty, I reply, and I for truth. Themself are one, we brethren are, he said. And so, as kinsmen met the night, we talked between the rooms until the moss had reached our lips and covered up our names. More funerals. Uh, she was, she's she been caricaturized uh, uh, by many, but probably most famously Mark Twain, uh, for this tendency to dwell on the somewhat uh, melancholy and morose. Um, so you get a lot of that. Um, the, uh, you know, the why you died for truth and beauty and the equation of the two, well, that's recalling Keats right there and um, sort of tossing it all into a, a, a jumble. Um, there is a very broken rhythm, a very broken syntax, a very inarticulate quality to it that makes you want to say, well, truth is beauty and beauty is truth. That is all you know and all you need to know. Well, that sounds great. I don't know what it means, but it sounds great. And here, it's just taking that smooth line and scrambling it so that, you know, for beauty, I replied, and I, for truth, themself are one, we brethren are. I have no idea what that means. I, it's just, it loses me. The syntax is all over the place. And again, the lady knew how to write a clear sentence. Clearly, when she does not, she means to... Uh, frustrate you for a reason and you got to ask why and you're allowed to you, you the, the, the great thing about reading is you are the best judge and if you don't understand what somebody is saying you can say that you can you shouldn't just toss up your arms and say well you know I'm not smart enough no you are because you're supposed to be confused it's the dummies who can read something like that and puzzle themselves into contortions trying to construct a meaning for it when perhaps it doesn't have one. Maybe it does. I'm sure people smarter than I am can do it, but I'm here just looking at it and saying, nope, I don't get it. Um, but I do like the poem. And again, you see like the irregular lines, the irregular uh, rhythms, the halting question you get you're getting uh, dashes in the middle of lines which just really break it up you're getting uh, off kilter uh, rhyme schemes again it's a uh, uh, it's uh, it's a puzzle one of her favorites or one not one I don't know her favorites but one of her really big ones 465 I heard a fly buzz when I died more funerals 
and the stillness in the room was like the stillness in the air between heaves of storm. The eyes around had wrung them dry, and breaths were gathering firm for the last onset, when the king be witnessed in the room. I willed my keepsakes, signed away what portions of me be assignable, and then it was there interposed a fly, with blue uncertain stumbling buzz between the light and me, and then the window failed, and then I could not see to see. I heard a fly buzz when I died. Uh, when I first read that in middle school, I was told that, well, you know, sure, when you're dying, maybe you hear the fly, and it's an indication that, well, the bugs are coming, and you are, it's a, uh, it's, it's like the angel of death. Um, okay, maybe. And here, the angel of death comes in the form of a fly. So not a spiritual uh, character, uh, not an angel, but a fly, a manifestation of nature. Uh, okay. Um, significantly, the contrast between the divine and the natural uh, come up again in a slightly more, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, grandiose terms, let's say. Um, uh, the breasts were gathering firm for that, for that last onset when the king be witnessed in the room. So this idea of, uh, I'm going to assume that the king is uh, either Christ or God or some divine figure who will, uh, you know, maybe it is again an angel of death, but it will be there in this momentous, and you can hear like, you know, the, the music playing and the cloud and rainbows and seraphs flying all around, um, you know, a big production. Uh, but then just the simple, humble, natural appearance of the fly is in direct contrast to that. And in between, you get this little discussion of, you know, uh, probate, the filling out of the will, which is so mundane and ordinary. But of course, there's nothing more humble than the fly who comes in and just sucks all of the grandeur out of the moment. And then towards the end, after that, you know, the, the granding swell of the king be witnessed in the room, that be witnessed also gives it a certain formality, certain biblical type of uh, syntax there. Um, uh, and you go through the probate and then the fly shows up. Uh, and then from there, the whole thing starts to wither away. Uh, and, and it's almost as if you are experiencing the death of this person whose consciousness is itself breaking down because with blue uncertain stumbling buzz between the light and me and then the window failed and then I could not see to see. Again, I'm not so sure what's going on there. It's very complicated and my sense is that the ability to reason is fading away and all you hear is or all you can sense is you hear a an uncertain stumbling buzz uh, with blue I'm not sure maybe uh, this is synesthesia they're hearing uh, they're hearing color uh, I'm, I'm not sure where that's going coming from between the light and me there's something between if the light is divine uh, um, is the divine presence of some sort. It is a, a barrier of some sort between the light and me. There is a barrier there. And just these loose images and sensibilities that are creeping in and giving a sense that it's all breaking down. It's all failing. And there's, it, it makes you question, well, of, of course, even the silliness or the, you know, the macabreness uh, writing I died in the first person past tense is automatically troubling. Uh, very few people get to tell the first, her, uh, first hand account of their death. And then at the end, when after it suggests that, well, okay, maybe this person did, at the end, no, because the mind seems to have broken down and lost its capacity for language and articulation. Um, you've passed on to something beyond the ability to explain in simple, logical language what death is.
632, the brain is wider than the sky, for put them side by side, the one the other will contain with ease, and you beside. The brain is deeper than the sea, for hold them, blue to blue, the one the other will absorb, as sponges, buckets do. The brain is just the weight of God, for heft him, pound for pound, and they will differ, if they do, as syllable from sound. Well, this is a curious little one. It has a certain simple uh, rhythm that holds uh, throughout, which can make it seem a little bit more accessible, a little bit more engaging. It's like, oh, good, I want something with a nice, simple, bouncy rhythm that I can follow along, and I'm not being jerked here and there by all these other meters. Um, irregularity is no fun. But just that notion, uh, the brain is wider than the sky. The brain. The brain is a physical organ. It's, you know, the, the mushy part inside your skull. The mind is something very different. And the fact that she chose the brain rather than the mind, I find really the key here. Because it's really a difference between the abs, between the abstract and the actual. Um, the abstract is the mind. The mind is limitless. The mind is, you know, whoa, human potential, all that enlightenment stuff. But the brain is just, you know, a, a clump of nerves. And when, when they start talking about the sky, well, you know, what is the sky? Is it just like the atmosphere around the earth? Is it the entire uh, hemisphere uh, of, uh, of, of, of the visible world is it the entire universe when you look up at the sky at night the eternity of it um it it doesn't quite fit but we're asked to consider that word in comparison with brain brain seems very prosaic and simple but sky opens it up to so many other uh notions so many other potentialities um, deeper than the sea well again uh, slightly more real perhaps slightly more finite but still enormous and uh, the uh, deeper than the sea um, I, I, I'm not sure um, and then that great last stanza the brain is just the weight of God for heft them pound for pound and they will differ if they do as syllable from sound. Syllable from sound, that's uh, the actual and, and the abstract again. Um, I, heft them is a great word. I love that word. It just, you know, don't, don't weigh them, don't lift them, heft them, get a sense of the weight. Um, and pound for pound. And at this point you're getting a sense that you're weighing God. Um, Weighing the brain is one thing, but weighing God is something that's getting very creepy. Um, so can God be made actual? Can God be made a physical presence? Um, it's, it's, it's an unanswerable question that the poem just sort of tosses out there within a very steady rhythm that suggests it is nice. 657, I dwell in possibility a fairer house than prose, more numerous of windows, superior for doors, of chambers as the cedars, impregnable of the eye, and, and for an everlasting roof, the gambrels of the sky. Of visitors the fairest for occupation this, the spreading wide my narrow hands to gather paradise which I, I just read as a, uh, a declaration of poetic philosophy or aesthetic is that poetry is an open medium, something that uh, can't be limited. Um, I dwell in possibility a fairer house than prose. She could make sense writing prose, uh, but who wants to make sense? Because then it has one meaning, uh, but if you have possibility, if you have uncertainty, if you have uh, the freedom, or if you instill the freedom in your reader to draw their own conclusions, there is no limit. It is uh, completely open. Okay. Probably her most famous, uh, 712. 
uh, because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. All right, I'm just going to read this, and then we'll get there. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. We slowly do drove, he knew no haste, and I had put away my labor and my leisure too for his civility. We passed the school where children strove at recess in the ring. We passed the fields of grazing, of gazing grain. We passed the setting sun, or rather he passed us. The dews drew quivering and chill for only gossamer my gown, my tippet only tull. We paused before a house that seemed a swelling of the ground. The roof was scarcely visible, the cornice in the ground. Since then, tis centuries, and yet feel shorter than the day I first surmised the horses' heads were toward eternity. So much going on here, formally. Um, first of all, another funeral, obviously. Um, but also, you can hear it when you read it aloud. It is one of the most regularly metered of her poems, uh, especially in the beginning. It breaks down more as it goes along, like a lot of them we've seen. But that beginning, because I would not stop for death, she kindly stopped for me, has a very sing-songy quality to it. It's, it's a hymnal quality. Scholar, scholars have uh, linked this up with uh, a lots of songs that are heard in church that people might sing and know the words to without ever actually thinking about them, without ever actually dwelling on them and saying, well, you know, why that word and what's that about? And it just becomes this ditty that gets played in your ear and has a pleasing sound in church and you just don't think about it. Um, one reading I heard of this once that suggested that you can sing it again. I don't really know the hymnal tradition, but that for the, the, those first uh, stanzas can be sung very conveniently to the tune for uh, the song Yellow Rose of Texas. Uh, because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves in immortality. Uh, you can go on, and I don't want to be dwelling in anybody's head with this for too long, but you get the idea. Um, but the, over the time, um, it starts to break down. And I would say that the, the way that you're trying it sort of trots along, you have to really pump the brakes as you're going to try and get a sense of what it means, what is going on here. This is, this is very macabre, this is very deep, this is very mysterious and opaque. What does it mean? But you've got that rhythm that's just pushing you along and you want to sing it for God's sakes. But you have to think about what it's saying. Um, you have to slow down. It is a clear divergence of form from content. The content is racing along and the form, or the form is racing along. The content is telling you, okay, no, this is troubling. This is disturbing. You need to stop with this. Um, it does this with the rhythm. It does it with the rhyme. The rhyme starts getting very irregular as you go along. Uh, it starts easy, me, immortality, um, away, civility is a little bit off, uh, and then ring and sun don't fit at all, uh, chill and tull, I don't know how to pronounce tool, tull, I think it's tool actually, um, I don't know, and then uh, what that next that next stanza just gives up entirely. Um, we paused before a house that seemed a swelling of the ground, the roof was scarcely visible, the cornice in the ground like she's given up on or the poem has given up on finding a rhyme and is just now flattened it out into sheer repetition just monotonous repetition um and then at the end sort of brings back the rhyme but in a, a, a again just an off way that feels very out of tune uh, since then to centuries and yet feels shorter than the day I first surmised the horses heads were towards eternity you can butcher that and say eternite um, but it makes my skin crawl to do that uh, but again that sense of irregularity um, and and it's it's telling you that 
the form and the content are very different and you need to slow down and consider what this is saying. Um, 1054 is uh, another fairly famous one and one that I think is very indicative of uh, her particular project and her part of romanticism. 1054, I never saw a moor, I never saw the sea, and yet I know how Heather looks and what a billow be. I never spoke with God nor visited in heaven, yet certain am I of the spot as if the checks were given. I never saw a moor, I never saw the sea. Those are specific but abstract notions. She's never seen the moor, let's say uh, the moors of England, Heathcliff on the moor in Wuthering Heights, uh, but, she, but she has an idea, she, she understands the elements within it. She understands the specifics. A moor is kind of abstract. Uh, a moor is distant, she's never seen it, she doesn't understand it. Uh, but I know how the heather looks, which is, well, okay, the, the tall grass that appears on a moor. Um, what this is, is she's working with metonymy, which is one little sliver that can stand for the whole. It's like saying uh, uh, the White House stands for the, uh, for the executive branch of the government. Um, so one little thing, just saying that, it gives you an idea of the whole. Um, so here she's saying, well, okay, uh, looking at it as a metonymy, I've got an understanding that, uh, of, of what this is, of what this can be, because I understand what Heather is. All I have to do is imagine a lot of it, and then I'm imagining a more. Um, and the same with, uh, with the sea. She's never seen the sea, uh, but I know what a billow, a wave, uh, is. So I can imagine one thing, I can imagine a lot of them, and that'll give me an idea of the whole. Um, the problem with this, or the question about it, comes when you open it up for not metonymy, but metaphor. Um, I never saw more, I never saw the sea. Uh, these are abstract notions, and if you just take them as metaphors for the ultimate abstract notion of God, um, then you can tell yourself a little story about how uh, this is about her profession of faith and saying, all right, I, I don't know the enormity of God, but I know the minute details of God. And that's enough for me, and it gives me uh, a sense of what, uh, um, gives me a sense of what the whole is. 1084, at half past three, a single bird unto a silent sky, propounded but a single term of cautious melody. At half past four, Experiment had subjugated test, and lo, her silver principle supplanted all the rest. At half past seven, element nor implement be seen, and place was where the presence was, circumference between. She's getting a little sarcastic here. She's getting a little playful. She's clearly uh, chiding the notion of science and reason in general in the face of nature saying, you know, it's just absurd to talk about certain things um, like a bird song in scientific terms. And she's giving all of these, uh, this, uh, this reasoned rhetoric uh, around uh, what is essentially a, uh, a poetic experience. Um, good poetic advice here, good writing advice. 1129, tell the truth, but tell it slant, success in circuit lies, the too bright for all, for, too bright for our infirm delight, the truth's superb surprise. As lightning to the children eased with explanation kind, the truth must dazzle gradually or every man be blind. Tell the truth, but tell it slant. Um, human beings are imperfect. Human beings are uh, flawed and limited, and we can't necessarily absorb full truth. So we got to take it just you know a little off to the side. Um, and it's a good poetic uh, device also because uh, she's saying that okay, idiosyncrasy, um, oddity, roughness, coarseness. Um, these open opportunities, these open potentialities for art. Uh, tell the truth, but tell it slant. Put a little angle on it, put a little spin on it so that it's not science, it's art. 
and maybe it's easier to take that way. Um, another difference between form and content, rhetoric and, uh, and the abstract. Uh, he preached upon breadth till it argued him narrow. The broad are too broad to define and of truth until he proclaimed it a liar. The truth never flaunted a sign. Simplicity fled from his counterfeit presence as gold the pyrites would shun. What confusion would cover the innocent Jesus to meet so enabled a man? A curious little lyric that I would say is just about a, uh, a well, it's a, let's say, a minister delivering a sermon that is a little high flown in its rhetoric uh, and it gets away from him and the rhetoric fails the experience of faith. Which is a uh, which is another like deeply romantic notion, the idea of the rhetoric being a formal arguing uh, or uh, persuasive speaking uh, science uh, attached to something so inherently irrational as faith. Uh, it's a uh, it's a fun little lyric. Um, 1554 takes another little swipe at um, uh, interpretations or literalist interpretations of the Bible. It's, a, it's obviously a later one. Um, if you take these as, uh, as written in time, again, not something I'm sure you can do. But 1550, 1545, the Bible is an ancient volume written by faded men as the suggestions of holy specters, subjects, Bethlehem, Eden, the ancient homestead, Satan, the brigadier, Judas, the great defaulter, David, the troubadour, sin, a distinguished precipice, others must resist, boys that believe are very lonesome, other boys are lost. Had but the tale a warbling teller, all the boys would come, Orpheus's sermon captivated, it did not condemn. Here uh, you can see uh, a, a critique of the culture of a perhaps repressive church or a uh, censorious church that comes down very hard on children and saying, well, if you just liven it up and make it a little bit more uh, accessible, perhaps a little bit more um, spirited, literally with, uh, with language, with storytelling, if you just put a different cast on it instead of having it be so negative and uh, it's treating the Bible as a work of literature here which is a very uh, dicey thing for her to do especially in her milieu but um, she's saying you know if you just look at the Bible as literature you can start to reimagine, well, maybe if we just make a few edits here and there, maybe if we just change the cast a little bit, maybe instead of having these rigid roles that are played in there, maybe if we just, you know, uh, jiggle it around a little, maybe we can get something a little bit more inviting, a little bit more uplifting, a little bit more, well, fun, sure. Um, one of her really later ones, 1732. My life closed twice before it's closed, it yet remains to see if immortality unveil a third event to me. So huge, so helpless to conceive as these that twice befell, parting is all we know of heaven and all we need of hell. Another funeral, um, another sense of um, the enigma of what lies out there, uh, a sense that perhaps there is something out there, but it is unintelligible to, uh, to man. Um, so huge, so hopeless to conceive as these that twice befell. Parting is all we know of heaven and all we need of hell. Uh, it is ultimately the connection that is the loss here, not the life necessarily, um, but the connection of human beings. Parting is all we know of heaven and all we need of hell. 
uh, is heaven really worth it? Hell and heaven are kind of equated in that last couplet. The um, it's an uncomfortable, disturbing little line that uh, <sighs> fits the poet. Dickinson was an uncomfortable poet, and she is really hard to get your hands around. I find every time I come to her, I need to get through probably a dozen poems. They're, again, they're all fairly short. I have to read through about a dozen before I start to hear the voice again, before I start to remember, oh yes, this is who she is. It takes a little while. It's an old friend that I need to remember. Oh, okay, she's got kind of a peculiar accent and sometimes can be a little off-putting but you know if you just lean in if you take that extra time wow what magic she brings to it and that is all the fun